You're listening to Voice Actor Showcase, episode number 28. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Voice Actor Showcase, a podcast about voice actors and their stories. I'm Jun Yoon. Please connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Voice Actor Show. These episodes are also available on youtube.com slash voicemoto. The Voice Actor Showcase is about the stories of voice actors from around the world on their journey to achieve the goal of becoming an established voice actor. And if you have an interesting story and you've been thinking your four layers of moving blankets around your box is just not cutting it anymore, I'd love to have you on the show to share your story. Please contact us by visiting voiceactorshowcase.com. And while you're there, please check out the store and pick up an introverted voice actor t-shirt or a record get money get tacos t-shirt for yourself or your favorite voice actor. Of course, the sales from the store will go to supporting this show as well as paying the voice actors in future episodes. Today, we'll meet a voice actor from the Seattle, Washington area. Much like the rest of us, he'd been interested in all things creative since he was a child. Thanks to tremendous support and guidance for his creativity from his courageous and loving mother, he'd been able to experience and express his art in many different forms. Later, he would meet Jessie, his wife, and she would be the one that pushes him into the world of acting. Soon after, he would discover voice acting through his father-in-law's company, and it had been a non-stop thrill ride since. He's the voice of Ash in the visual novel The Pretender's Guild, the stubborn traffic bot in Encodia, and the grieving and vengeful commander from the game Colony Siege. His voice can be heard in the upcoming RPG The Mechanical World of Dr. Gearbox, an adventure RPG that incorporates education and learning into its gameplay, where he also worked as a casting director. Please welcome Christian O'Boyle. Communications are down. I can't get a signal from Arc Lab. It's a jammer. Zorn is on to us. We need off this rock now. Ready the trap! Come on, big guy. Just a little closer. <laughs> okay, we got him. That was close. It was a good run, soldier. You gave me a purpose after this world went to hell. <clears throat> now go. <laughs> I'll see you on the other side. <sighs> Hold the bow just a little higher and release. Not bad. You're getting better by the day. Let's go show Anari what you can do. I swore an oath to your father that I would protect you, Clara. I will fight by your side, even if that means this kingdom falls with me in it. It's not stealing if you're taking it from another thief. <laughs> ah, got it. Now that's what I call a payday. Christian O'Boyle. Hello, sir. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm well. Thank you very much. I hope you're staying safe and in the house and saving the world. Uh, staying safe in the house. Not entirely sure about saving the world, but I'll do what I can. <laughs> Give yourself some credit. By staying home, we're saving the world. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. There you go. Right. <laughs> that creature demo. Oh, my goodness. Tell me more about that creature demo. 
Um, so I was working with Tony Weiss um, on my video game demo. Um, he is now my co-founder at Immerse Productions or business partner. Um, and as we were kind of playing around with the different characters, uh, and we talked for probably about four hours after our first consultation, um, it kind of got to the point where I started just making different noises. Yeah. And he goes, could you try doing this? I did it. And he goes, what do you think about doing a creature demo? He goes, I'll throw it in for like half price because we're doing a video game demo. I just did a commercial demo with him. And he goes, I'll throw in a creature demo half price. And he goes, what do you think about that? I was like, sure, I'll do it. Yeah. So sure enough, we uh, we just <laughs> cranked out so many different creature sounds. And he goes, <laughs> I did not uh, think you had all that in you. So I kind of continued <laughs> working with the creature sounds. And it's it's a fun little niche that... Uh, I enjoy doing. How fun! I'm. I have used them in games um, for different creatures. Uh, several with the mechanical world of Doctor Gearbox. Um, I house so many different cr- uh, creatures in that game to where I have to basically explore everything, create new sounds that I haven't played with before, and just kind of go with it. Um, the one that kind of leads off with it, the. <laughs> was basically what enacted um, that idea. It was just, it's a backwards uh, tongue roll where you're breathing in instead of doing the regular. <laughs> so it's backwards. Uh, and that was something I was playing with for, it was like me talking in a normal conversation and I would just yeah. breathe in and kind of make a, a little stutter with my tongue. I'm like, what is that? And eventually I kind of kept on pursuing that sound until I was able to do it and then I can now use that in different formats it, it started off with the and then it <laughs> did the the one that it did previously and then I can uh, shift it to type thing oh my gosh uh, so they're just different creatures that I can do and then that's just the the start of it you and then you get into roll uh, low growls uh, for bigger creatures obviously um you might need to do some pitch shift and some audio editing to really make the thing sound so much grander and stuff like that. But it, it's the level of just starting off with uh, a sound like. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated and intrigued and entertained. Oh, that is so great. <laughs> Hmm, it's making me think too. That's how fun. <laughs> it, it, it's a lot of fun. As long as, obviously, this kind of goes with voice acting in general. If it hurts, stop. Right, right. Like, obviously, you, you don't want to push it too far. But if you know, you find a way that you can make a sound and it might maybe strain a little bit, but you feel like if you worked on it, you might find a better way to make the sound, you can probably hone that one. Um <sighs> But obviously, if it hurts just right off the bat, and you're like, I don't, I'm pushing and I'm reaching, don't pursue that until later. Some, there, there's some, poss- it, po- it's possibilities. It's creative exploration, and there's lots of limitless possibilities in that mm-hmm. realm. That's what a, what, a, what a thing to think about. Thank you very much for that. That's great. Of course. Now, let's wind it back to the very beginning, as I, as I typically do with these interviews. Sure. Um, I'd love to hear some stories from when you were a kid. Like, what kind of things did you do for fun? And what kind of, like, creative expressions or activities did you enjoy as a kid? Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about siblings, family dynamics, sure. growing up in Washington, so on and so forth. Uh, so, way back uh, when I was a kid, um, basically, uh, I was raised by a single mother. Uh, but she was a she's very creative. She likes... Um, doing crafts and stuff like that. And I kind of picked that up as a, as a kid. Um, started picking up that I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed drawing and coloring and uh, you name it. Anything that was artistic and creative, I at least probably pursued in some sort of way. Nice. Most of everything. But still have a lot to explore since it's a very big realm. Um, 
So it was it was just exploring the different avenues of creation and expression because art is all about expression and I can express myself in different ways through different formats and mediums. And I may be not good in all formats, but I still enjoy um, everything. Now, when it came to eventually uh, later down the line, my mom started dating um, her now current uh my my stepdad, uh, they he had two kids that lived with him, and then two other kids um, that weren't living with us. And so, they're like siblings to me. Um, we got into sports together. We did basketball. Uh, we all did baseball and softball. Um, I continued. Oh, we all did bowling. We all bowled. Um, <laughs> nice. And then I, I pursued, not pursued, I, I did football and stuff like that. So yeah. sports was a huge um, activity that I did in high school. It was all about um, camaraderie and and being able to learn that it's not about, all about you. It's about the team. And so it just really helped form uh, who I am in terms of being able to work with everyone and stuff like that. So I mm. kind of did music. I did uh, drawing, writing. Eventually, pr- photography came on, on on onto my radar later down the line. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it was uh, something that I've always done. Have you always lived in Washington? Yeah, yeah. So I was born in Seattle and kind of... Grew up a bit in Kirkland, and then we moved to Bonnie Lake uh, when I was in elementary. And so I kind of grew up in this area um, most of my life. Hmm. I see. Uh, any are there are there any specific traits or or elements of growing up in Seattle as opposed to or in Washington in Washington as opposed to L.A. or New York or some town in Texas. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't technically live in the city. I'm about 40, 40 45 minutes away from Seattle. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's nice that I can go into the city without having to drive several hours. Um, if I wanted to jump to the next biggest city in this area, Tacoma, it's a 20-minute drive. It, it doesn't take that much. Um Everyone assumes that Washington is always raining, and technically that's <laughs> not exactly true. Uh, it's usually gray and overcast, generally during winter, fall, and then some of spring. But at the same time, uh, if it is raining, it's like drizzling. So that's why when you go in Washington, you see everyone walking around with maybe a sweatshirt and a hood or a jacket. Huh. And they don't have umbrellas because it's a, a little drizzle. Um so we're kind of used to it. But at the same time, because it rains quite frequently, going outside isn't necessarily something you do very often. And when you do, you're probably doing sports inside or you're doing something inside. And that's probably where a lot of the creativity kind of drew up because obviously it's raining. You got to get out your coloring book or you got to start drawing or writing or anything of, of that sort. So that's probably another influence in terms of creativity is kind of being locked inside some of the times throughout the year. Interesting, indeed. I mean, first of all, I'm I'm in agreement with you. I'm in a I'm in a city called Long Beach, just like 45 minutes down south of LA. Mm-hmm. I tell everybody I'm in LA, but I like my suburban neighborhood very much. So, mm-hmm. indeed. All right. So, being able to participate in so many different like ways of creative expression, sports, and social circles, you must have been really, really busy during your school years. I mean, that's a lot of that's a lot to balance for teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got friends with theater, band, and dance, and sports, and I, I never saw them really outside the theater when we would connect. Mm-hmm. Sounds like you were in a very similar boat. Um, I'd love to hear some stories from your school days. What kind of student were you? Um, what kind of subject did you like? And and are there any fun stories? It's hard to say. Looking back in high school, I was your average kind of floater kid. I wasn't a preppy band. I wasn't considered the geek. I wasn't considered the nerd. I wasn't considered the gothics or anything like that. I was just your average student that could drift from group to group to group. 
Um, so that's kind of what I did. Probably hung out mostly with the band um, and theater kids uh, because, again, that's what we all related to. So maybe if you had a specific section called like the art kids or something like that, I, I'm not entirely sure if that was a click. Um, hmm. So that was kind of my group of friends. Uh, in terms of activities that I participated in, I was in band um, from eighth grade till I almost graduated. I didn't finish wow. the last semester in band due to credits. I had to uh, stop doing band the last uh, semester so I could get my last credit. Um, but I was in band um, throughout my entire high school. Um, football, again, throughout entire high school. I got into baseball from fifth grade all the way to 10th grade, but I continued umpiring. I was an umpire for baseball, and that was from like eighth grade until graduation. I got into bowling. I was in a bowling league from eighth grade to past high school um, and and stuff like that. In terms of how much free time I had, I mean, I was always busy. Um, yeah. I was a straight A student, so I was always getting... Uh, good grades. And so my mom's like, hey, if you can get good grades, you can focus on your studies and do everything, by all means, have fun. Uh, and so I did. I, I was able to get uh, really good grades. Um, and at the same time, I would finish football practice and still have a couple hours left. I would hop over to my best friend's house because he literally lived like five minutes from the, the school, if not that in my house from the school until I moved in uh, junior year, my house was like 10 minutes. So freshman to mi middle of junior year, I was living like 10 minutes from the school, maybe five. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a hop and a skip to my friend's house and we would just hang out, play video <laughs> games and whatnot. I would return home, maybe do some homework if I had any. But usually I was finished with my homework before I even finished and stuff like that straight a kid absolutely yeah so it was it was uh it was interesting it, it was i was never extremely busy uh, or <laughs> to me i never felt overwhelmed or over busy <laughs> but i guess if you looked on the outside you'd be like where where's your life my life was everything if you look at it, i had friends in all of these places and stuff like that so it was it was a fun way to be as rounded as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm actually particularly interested in the band experience. My wife mm -hmm. uh, is also a huge band person, uh, middle school to high school, and and I'm also a musician. And we both agree that um, the instruments that we play reflect who we are, kind of mm -hmm. in that manner. We call them dumbers for a reason. <laughs> I'm going to take that out. <laughs> I'm going to guess that your instrument when you are in band, trombone. Nope. Trumpet. Nope. Dang it. What did you play? I was a percussionist. Ah, you're a drummer. I am a drummer. <laughs> yep, I, I started, uh, it was my birthday on uh, my seventh grade. I, what was that? How old is that? 13? My 13th birthday, my dad bought me a snare drum because he found out I was interested in that and kind of wanted to pursue the, the music a bit. So he ended up buying me a, um, a snare drum, and then I took band in eighth grade and just fell in love with percussion and stuff like that. I bought my own drum set with my own money um, that I had saved up from chores and mowing lawns and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I ended up buying my own drum set, and that was, again, right before I actually started taking band. And then I still play uh, the drums. I play for wow. church. I'm one of the main drummers. Uh, main is kind of hard. There's about six, seven, or eight drummers that we rotate through at church. Um, gotcha. So I'm one of those drummers that get rotated through quite frequently. That's awesome. It's taking a passion from like youth and still exercising today, acting upon it today. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I that part of you I envy. I do. I I wish I could go back to badminton, but I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> too old and cranky, crankly muscles and all this stuff. Ugh. Never, never, never <laughs> too old. You know what? You're right. You're right. I I'm gonna reach out. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, ugh. let's move on. Um. I also come from a household of a single mother. Mm -hmm. um, so I have 
immense amount of respect and love and guidance and, and everything that my mom has done for me so far. And that at this age, we obviously keep in contact mm-hmm. and like time has come where I'm able to provide things for her now. So that gives me a certain level of pride. I'd love to hear more about your mom. Um, so my mom and dad, uh, split when I was a year and a half. Um, but they had uh, split custody. So I would see my dad, at least during the time I was living uh, in Kirkland, I would almost see him every weekend. And eventually, as we got older and we ended up moving in Bonnie, to Bonnie Lake, I would see him every other weekend. Um, so he was still a, a pretty big part of my life, mm-hmm. um, but not as big as my mom, who would basically do anything she could to allow me to pursue things I was interested in, whether that's sports, uh, band, Hmm. um, art, creativity, anything like that. She would go out of her way to be able to provide that opportunity. Um, She had a job that didn't pay well. I mean, she, she had her own cleaning business where she just cleaned by herself and she probably didn't charge as much as she, she could have. So she was kind of making close to minimum wage, but she would still find some way to still pay the $400 fee to sign up for football or any camps or anything like wow. that. She would even sometimes take two jobs if she needed to and never complained. Um, She's very, very selfless. Um, Obviously, when you get to a teenager, you kind of always think, uh, Mom, you're crowding me and smothering me and stuff like that. But as I got married uh, and we had to set our boundaries, uh, the relationship kind of rekindled and got closer as I continued getting older. Obviously, there's that awkward teenager stage. But again, she never not she never did not support me that did not make sense in terms of sentence but (laughs) she was always supporting me no matter what yeah how how unfortunate at the same time how fortunate are we both man that's that's great that's amazing thank you very much and if one day i'm sure i'll meet her i don't know if i will or not but i'd really love to shake her hand and thank her in person that's awesome she, basically everyone in theater knows my mom uh, <laughs> it, it, there, yes. there's no way of not knowing that, that that's my mom she she shouts it to the rooftops that i'm her son type thing and then our similarities continue from there on my wife is also a huge influential figure in my life with our own story of how we met. Um, Taking a look at your Instagram feed and and looking at some of your online profiles, I came across a picture of you and Jesse, your wife, both of you in costume. Tell us about the story of how the two of you met. Uh, So that image that you're referring to, I believe that was our first and so far only Comic-Con that we ever went to. And we wanted to cosplay. So she made a Briar Rose costume from Sleeping Ah. Beauty, and I was Prince Philip. Um, Obviously, she was going around Comic-Con. Everyone's like, ah, Briar Rose. Oh, it's Aurora. And then, obviously, it's like, oh, and it's Prince Philip. And then one one person's like, oh, it's Prince Philip. I was like, I didn't even have her with me, and they knew who I was. Yes. Um, (laughs) In terms of how we met, we actually met at a church camp. Uh, a summer camp, and we, well, it's kind of hard to say specifically that because the first time we met was actually at a friend's, like, uh, New Year's Eve party in, like, sophomore year. But it was more like she was there, I was there, mutual friends, and we kind of said hi. That was it. In terms of really getting to know her was at that church camp the following year, um, and we kind of started talking and kind of um, communicating and stuff like that. Obviously, after summer camp, we kind of returned to our normal lives um, and kind of didn't really see each other afterwards uh, until the following year. Again, same summer camp. She was there, but um, her boyfriend at the time actually broke up with her that same time. So she ended up leaving that summer camp Mm. and ended up, I think they went to... Las Vegas with her her parent, her mom, and some uh, friends. Uh, 
So I didn't see her for the rest of that. Obviously, she was gone. Uh, and I was like, all right, well, I probably won't see her again. Well, again, said mutual friend, uh, we didn't go to the same church either. It was a different church. It was just a, a church camp that had like three different churches there. So that small church that she was a part of, or at least her friend was a part of that she ended up tagging along, uh, they were having a youth group. I was invited to that youth group uh, get together. She was there and we kind of started talking from there. And one thing led to another to where uh, we were just out of high school. We were 18 when we started dating. It's a faded encounter. That's what it sounds like to me. It was definitely everything kind of led into one thing into another. It wasn't uh, intentional. Yeah. And the, as quick as we started dating, it was definitely by no means intentional because I was like, all right, I really like her. I want to ask her out, but she just got out of this relationship two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago. And I was like, it's too soon. I want to wait. Um, but that didn't happen. Next thing you knew, uh, just three weeks after that relationship i was we were dating and at first obviously you think well that means i was a rebound well obviously i was not the rebound because i am now married to her um yeah. so she goes <laughs> i don't rebound and she goes i saw what was in your heart and stuff like that and kind of fell in love what was in your personality and that's kind of where we started uh, our relationship very sweet that was a great story i like that so much Ooh. <laughs> And then it was her who really got you into acting. I mean, I was reading your questionnaire and I honestly was laughing out loud reading the answer to your questionnaire. Uh, how has she very lovingly encouraged you to act? So I've always been interested in acting. Um, always had that. I can't do that, but that's kind of cool. I never saw theater. Never went to a, a high school play. Never went to any uh, professional theater or anything like that. Uh, she started getting into uh, a local community theater, which is actually, I would put them in the gray area because the quality of shows that they put on is very professional. The only reason why it's not as professional as, say, some of the larger um, theaters in our area's budget. Um, otherwise, the the acting the singing the dancing uh, the 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 directors they're the directors because they're husband and wife they're actually from LA oh. and they actually ran a theater there and she actually ran a ballet company for a while so again very professionals um, now teaching a community theater so I saw the first show she was in which was Sleeping Beauty and I was like wow that was really good interesting. Um, from there, I took her to um, Cinderella, Rogers and Hammerstein, Cinderella mm. at the Fifth Avenue um, for her 21st birthday, I believe, or 22nd. I think it was 22nd, 22nd birthday. And we went to Rogers and Hammerstein at, uh, at the Fifth Avenue, and it was phenomenal. I uh. really enjoyed it. It was funny, and I really enjoyed that side of art. Uh, she did another show, which was Oliver, the fo uh, just after uh, Sleeping Beauty. And that, again, was phenomenal to watch and really enjoyed it. And both times I went to um, the cast party. And hearing the cast talk about their their relationship and how much it felt like family and just the passion they had for each other, not just for, I'm going to put on a performance and yeah. wow you. No, no, no. They were very humble and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, I really am interested in this. So I brought it up to Jesse and said, hey, um, I'm thinking I would, I'm, I want to aud audition for the next show you auditioned for. And she goes, well, well honey. I was like, yeah. She goes, you know, you can't sing. I was like, well, I, I know. I, I can work on it. I'll, I'll work on it. And she goes, okay. You know you can't act. I, I, yeah, I know. I, I, I can work on that, too. That, 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 can, that can come. Honey, you, you can't dance. Well, I know I can't dance. And uh, sure enough, we started taking, um, I started taking some lessons with her. Or at least she was kind of coaching me through it. Um, yeah. It was very quick that I ended up taking uh, coaching lessons um, 
there was a guitar center class that they had for uh, one-on-one coaching. And so I took some lessons and then I auditioned. Uh, the first show I auditioned for, I got cast, which was Snow White. Um, obviously, I was ensemble. And the funny thing is, being ensemble, they, they sometimes throw you onto sets and stuff like that so you can push it around when you're not on stage. Well, one of the sets was the cabin. And the cabin had to rotate in the middle of the scene. Uh, and obviously, we you have to manually do it because we don't actually have the, the, the system to do it automatically. Right. So I'm sitting in a what they carved out to be <laughs> uh, a tree. And my other the other actor who was on the other side of the cabin was in the fireplace. And I'm sitting there, I think it was either during the show or during tech week as I started really putting it in. Because obviously it started off with chicken wire and framing and stuff like right. that. So after they did Mosh Bodge and started painting and I, I realized, oh, this is a tree. This is a tree. <laughs> I'm the tree and this is my first show. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Tree number two. <laughs> it, it just, it, it, it was one of those realizations, like my first show ever, and I'm the tree. Oh my gosh. Obviously, no one knew what anyone was in there because we would just rotate it and then sit in there in the dark. And then obviously, I would come out and we would do, um, I was an ensemble member um, as well. And my wife, Jessie, was my wife in the the show and we had a child and obviously I was very pitchy. I was not great at singing. I some, <laughs> still somehow got cast. So I was decent enough or they just needed men. Probably they just needed men. Uh, so I was singing <laughs> and the little girl who was playing our daughter, very sweet girl, um, but very has been in theater since who knows how long, like she was right. four or something like that. <laughs> and I was singing and obviously I, I get pitchy and I was very off again for show. Uh, and she would just look at me <laughs> and be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm trying. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so that was the first show. I think I've done 12 shows total now. Um, so I, I assume it's been six years, so I assume I'm better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, judging by your voice acting history and the credits that belong under your name, I'd say you've improved quite a bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, we'll get, we'll get to the voice acting portion of this interview in a second, but I do want to talk about your photography business, mm -hmm. uh, which you mentioned uh, that you really enjoy it, enjoyed as a child. Now, what? Was this kind of a dream? Had that been realized kind mm. of a thing? I mean, what's what's up with the photography? Uh, it was really just... Um, you always see the people walking around with DSLR cameras, and I go, wow, that's really nice. I like those photos. I, I want to take photos. At this time, I'm like 15, 16, maybe even older, 17 or 18. Uh, and obviously, like, photography was one of those things. I don't have one of those cameras. I didn't think about it type thing. So, uh, my aunt was a photographer, uh, a street photographer in Seattle. And so I kind of started talking to her and she kind of took me around and kind of showed me her camera a little bit. Um, I went to freshman year at UW Tacoma, which is a great school, but they have no art classes at all. Huh. So I, I took my first, my first quarter there. And you, obviously, you just do the mandatory classes that you're given. The second quarter, as I'm signing up, and I was going through the classes that I had to select for election, and there was not a single art class. And I'm sitting there like, what? How? How? How is there no art? So I talked to the counselor and like, well, unfortunately, this is like a business, and we focus on sciences and stuff like that. So... Um, we don't have art here. And I was like, what? you don't have art? I'm not going oh through my. four years of college and not taking art. <laughs> At the same time, my wife was going to a community college uh, just down on the other side of, I don't know, 30 minutes from where I was in my school. Yeah. And obviously where we lived was like right in the middle. Uh, so she was going to Green River Community College and she goes, oh yeah, look at this art class, this one, this one, this one. She was listing all the art classes that she had to pick from. And I was like, 
<laughs> what? I want to do that. So I actually transferred from university to a <laughs> community college. Nice. My dad was not very pleased because he goes, "You're you're pursuing a a, a bachelor's, and now you're going to a community college." And I was like, "Well, if I continue, if I enjoy school, I'll just continue and I'll move on to a, a bachelor's. If I don't, then I, at least I graduate with a, an associate since I graduated college." Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I ended up taking the first. So this is this would be spring quarter um, of freshman year. So I transferred in the middle of freshman year, uh, and I took photography, uh, black and white film, and I really, really, really enjoyed it. My mm. again aunt showed me around. She lo- loaned me uh, uh, her camera, and we kind of went around Seattle. She showed me how to use it and stuff like that. Really, really enjoyed the process, and so I ended up buying. Uh, a DSLR like right after that class was finished and as soon as I bought the DSLR I signed up to be uh, I signed and created a photography business and I'm like I'm going to be a professional photographer (laughs) because now I have a DSLR camera like almost everyone does no no judgment Um, but I was definitely not ready I was like, I have a DSLR camera. I took digital photography the next quarter. And I'm like, I have a digital camera. I'm And I kind of know how to edit, which I didn't. And so I thought <laughs> I was hot stuff. And so I took digital art uh, one and two. And it was not that good. <laughs> and I was like, I'm a professional. Um, so this is in 20... Oh, what is this now? We're in 2010, 2011, um, about so. So I kind of went around saying that I was a professional, even though I clearly wasn't um, until I was. Um, So I kind of did like the wedding here, which wasn't good. I did the couple of portraits here, which were mediocre. I did this. (laughs) I did that. Obviously, over time, my, my ability got better. Right, And I kind of had this interest in interior design. At this time, I'm not very into, um, I'm already graduated college. It's about 2013 or so. And um, I was, I really liked the interior design, HGTV and all that stuff and really nice photos. So I was Uh. like, hmm, maybe I should try some real estate photos. Reached out to a real estate photographer did the first one, which was for the real estate agent who helped me or us buy our first house. And huh. I spent three and a half hours on set, which or on, on location, which was a, a friend of ours was selling their house. Family friend of Jesse's family. So I was taking photos. I was moving things and stuff like that and really make, putting all my effort into making these great. Wow. Again, first time, they were okay. Uh, I didn't get paid for that one at all. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Uh, I did another photo shoot uh, for another real estate agent almost a couple weeks later. I took all the photos, obviously didn't spend as much time. Uh, These ones looked a little bit better than the first ones. And I sent it to her via Dropbox. She didn't know how to use Dropbox, so she saved the thumbnails and says, hey, Christian, your images oh. are very, very blurry. And I said, oh. what do you mean? How would you, you download it? And she goes, oh, don't worry about it. I just uh, had my son go out there and take the photos. I was like, are you oh. kidding me? <laughs> so Gosh. here's my two int- like photos, a first time ever doing real estate photos. I was like, nope, never happening again. Yeah. Roll around 2015, uh, I'm... I have a friend who in I'm now in theater. I have a friend who's a real estate agent. I threw out the thing of, oh, yeah, I've done a couple homes. And he en- eventually reached out to me. I did a photo for him. Again, pretty okay. But next thing I know, the real estate company that was in the office building I was working at, because now I'm working for, I'm not no longer working in the port. I'm working for my father-in-law. Um, and... There was a real estate company that was in the, in the same building. So somehow I ended up landing a photo shoot with them. Again, I probably t- I was talking to uh, one of the secretaries and I dropped, oh, yeah, I've done a couple and I've, I've just done one for Adam. She goes, oh, I know Adam. I was like, well, that, that's <laughs> funny. Um, so I ended up doing a photo shoot for them. Next thing you know, Adam reaches out to me and it just kind of 
snowballed to yeah. where I was like, oh, I actually have extra money. I was like, I can upgrade my gear. 2015, I, I started investing in gear. 2016 rolls around, and I had a very consistent photo shoots for real estate. Wow. And so I continued investing in gear. And about middle to end of 2016, I reached out to an interior designer and said, hey, blah, blah, blah. I'm a, a real estate photographer or interior photographer, and I'm interested <laughs> in uh, photographing. And I, obviously, I reached out to a lot of uh, interior designers until one actually said, yeah, let's let's do a photo shoot. I did it. Yeah. And these photos look, they're still on my portfolio. Boom. The very first yeah. photo shoot. Um, and it just, again, kind of snowballed. I, I, 2017 rolled around. I'm not investing as much into my gear. I already have all the gear I need. Um, and only a couple things that I, I was upgrading and I just continued building and roll around. Uh, 2019 was kind of mm, okay. I made more money in voiceover, uh, and website design for voiceover than I think I did that's probably not right because I do make quite a bit when I do an interior design, but yeah. it kind of evened out to where I made the same amount in 2018. This year, obviously, pandemic, everything, a whole <laughs> right. different situation. I haven't done a real estate photo shoot this entire year. I had about five or six interior designers lo- lined up, and obviously that didn't happen. Uh, yep. So I need to reach out to them eventually when we get there. Uh, so yeah, that that is my wow. photography business. Uh, it's actually at christianjanderson.com is my interior design and real estate photography. Um, I actually still do headshots and mostly headshots for voice or actors from main stage, uh, and every once in a while the occasional wedding or something like that. But wow. mostly interior designer, architectural photographer with the occasional headshot. What an interestingly co-concurring business to your voice acting. I, it's so. Uh... It's related, but it's not. At the mm-hmm. same time, um, it kind of sounds like the trend, not the trend, but the direction of balancing those two uh, businesses is tilting towards voiceover until this whole COVID-19 thing happened, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But And so when it came to photography, it, it actually helped me when I started voiceover. I already knew the side of business. I knew marketing. I knew branding um, right. and stuff like that. So when I hit voiceover, I hit the ground running. In terms of that stuff, I was making as much noise as possible going, hey, 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 I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And again, continued building up and reaching out and obviously honed on my my voiceover. And at one point, I was driving out to an interior design photo shoot. My Jessie was my uh, my uh, assistant because she's actually really good. And she has a good eye for this stuff. Uh, so she was my assistant. And she goes, OK, I have to ask you, if you had to choose, would you choose photography or would you choose voiceover? Right. And I said, voiceover. She goes, really? I said, huh. yeah. Uh, she goes, then why are we doing photography? I was like, because I still <laughs> really love photography. Yeah. It's just if I were to choose one, I would choose voiceover because I can do it at home. I don't have to go out. I can put in as much time and acting and all that stuff. It's an, a great way of expression. But the only thing is, and and at the same time, it, the, the, the amount of time you put into voiceover is not the same as how much time you have to put into a photo shoot. Of course. One photo shoot. To do an interior design photo shoot, obviously you have to pack up. You got to get everything prepared the day before. Then you have, and this is not even talking about invoicing and all that other stuff. (laughs) Then you have to drive there, which is an hour, hour and a half away because I actually really commute when it comes to interior design because it actually pays for it. Uh, So then it's an hour and a half away. So that's hour and a half there, hour and a half back. All right. We're already at about three hours. Plus, if you talk prep time, we're already at like five hours. Uh, Then you're on location. If it's a full day shoot, you're looking at anywhere from six to eight hours on location. Oh, wow. Then you have to pack everything (laughs) up and you have to haul it back home. And then to edit, I throw it into the computer. I do some global adjustments. I send it to the client. The client goes, yes, I want this, 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 and this, and this. I say, great. Let me edit those images. Two weeks later, maybe a week, <sighs> just depending on the, how many and the, how, the, the, the size of how much needs to be edited. A week to two weeks later, then I send it to the client. So we're wow. looking at almost two and a half weeks worth of effort in, ter- in terms of just one photo shoot. Voiceover, obviously, you you go, 
hey, audition, that takes you five minutes. Send, <laughs> you get cast. Oh, great. Here's the script. Great. Read it. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe an hour. <laughs> Send it off, get paid. Agreed. Much, much uh, faster <laughs> and easier yeah. in so, that regard. Yeah. In, in, that, in that regard, yes, I would choose voiceover over photography. If I were to go full-time uh, freelance, I would do it all. I would do photography. Yeah. I would do voiceover. I would do website design because they all pay and they're all extra little bits that will actually help support you over the, the long run. Absolutely. At the same time, you're not actually a full-time freelancer. No. You are a software support specialist for a 3D landscape software company. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Uh, it means many things, actually. So I was first working in my first job, which was a... Um, I was a gate technician or gate agent um, at the Port of Tacoma. Basically, what that means is the truck drives in. I inspect the truck. I type in the numbers to register it. I give ah. the ticket to the driver and tell him where to park. That was most of my job. It was really fun because a lot of uh, a lot of culture came through India. Uh, so Indians, Russians, Ukrainians, Moldovians. I found out the big difference between all three. Don't wow. confuse a Ukrainian with a Russian. You, you'll get threatened. <laughs> and I did several times. Oh, gosh. Uh, and then there's all these other um, French, Canadian, and all this stuff. Really, really, really fun with talking to the drivers. The job itself, meh. And when it came to the big wigs as we were actually trying to get a raise, it was more like, mm, I'm making too much off of these guys to give them that kind of raise. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> I'm not going to work for you. <laughs> so I ended up starting looking for a new job, and I was looking at carpentry interior design. But again, that's a vocational school. It's going to take four to five years of all that stuff. So I had no idea what I was going to do. I have no resume, no job history. So I'm like, I have no idea. Wow. My father-in-law caught wind one of the Christmas parties that I made the joke because Jesse had worked in this position that I'm at now for like two weeks. And then she, then someone else was working it. So I kind of made the joke of, oh, yeah, I always thought it would be cool to do this support for the company. And they all kind of like, oh, yeah, that'd be cool type thing. <laughs> Obviously, they didn't need it because they already had someone. Literally in January or something, the guy who was working the software support specialist uh, position ended up putting in his three weeks resignation or two weeks resignation. They said, Oh. oh, or actually, he didn't put in his resignation right away. It was more, I actually reverse that. He put yeah. in about a month. And I said, great. He ended up, my father-in-law ended up reaching out to me saying, hey, uh, do you want to meet at Starbucks? I have a proposition for you. Wow. So I met with him. He ended up saying his spiel. I said, I thank you. I'd never really thought about working inside in an office. That's not my shtick. And he goes, <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate your honest I know you, you're loyal, you're married to my daughter. And he lists off a couple things. He goes, I would rather <laughs> train you than train someone I don't know or have someone who already has the experience and I don't know and trust. Yeah. And I said, all right. He goes, by all means, you are not obligated to stay. Also, this would be your starting wage. And I was like, well, that's better than what I'm making. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I put in my three weeks. Sure enough, the 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 specialist that ended up I was replacing ended up backing out, like leaving a lot sooner. So like, OK, we need you now. So yeah. I ended up going to my my boss at the time and said, unfortunately, I can't make it to the three weeks. And obviously bridges weren't burned or anything like that. But thankfully, uh, everything was understandable ended up mm. uh, taking over that position. Now, what do I do? Uh, so my father-in-law created a 3D landscape software company um, back in 2004. And this company is among the top-rated 3D landscape softwares in the industry. Um, we have been rated at number one on top 10 reviews since 2011. Wow. Um, so it's a really big company. Huh. Uh, not big company. I, I got take, I take that back. It's a really big business, but we only have like six employees. Wow. So I do mm, sales and software support. So I know the pro program front and back. I can yeah. tell you everything. And if I don't know, it, I can figure it out in like 10 minutes. Um, so that's, that's mostly what I do. I talk to customers that call in and I assist them with the program. Uh, my father-in-law actually worked at 
uh, Edmark. He worked at uh, The Trade. He worked at um, Sierra. He's worked at Microsoft. He's been the lead programmer. He he was the lead programmer for Crimson Skies and all that stuff. And then he Jeez. ended up leaving Microsoft, created his own business. And since then, he's been running his own business. Um, so he's very, very, very well-rounded. And he's been pro- doing this uh, program for since 2004. So roll around uh, 2015, 16, he kind of was like, I really want to make a game. And so oh. he started just making a game. <laughs> and sure enough, that that's actually what the, the, developed into what he has now. And that game is Colony Siege. Yes. Tell us about your involvement in that game. Probably about two years down the line after he's been working on this, he finally comes and he goes, I'm really thinking about having everyone like voice in this. He goes, I've done it before. We'll all just say our lines and stuff like that. We'll throw it in the program and we'll call it good. And I'm like, great, that sounds good. I have a $50 ah. microphone. I think it's a newer. <laughs> I was like, and I have a stand. So we'll just, and because Jesse and I did vlogging, uh, we have a, a YouTube channel called Mr. and the Misses. So I had bought, bought this gear before and I was like, I'll just slap it in this extra room we have and we'll just start <laughs> acting. It's like, that sounds great. He goes, yeah, that sounds good. So then I start doing research in terms of voice acting and stuff like that. And I said, oh, well, that's not what I thought it was <laughs> uh, because initially I looked at voice acting, we'll say eight years ago, eight or 10 years ago. And I was watching voice actors do voice acting, repeating the line over and over. And, and I go, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> and I never thought about voice acting again until well after I started getting to theater and really understanding the process of what it actually takes to act and right. stuff like that. So my appreciation of acting changed completely as I start looking into voice acting again. I said, ooh, this is fun. <laughs> I really enjoy this. Nice. And I enjoyed the thought of it 10 years ago, but now I really enjoy this. So then I come up to him as like, okay, no, it's not just that. And I started really thinking about, all right, you need a good microphone. You need uh, whatever it's called, an interface. Uh, and you need a space so that you, you don't know, have the, 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 the echo is what I call it. The echo in your, your sound. <laughs> and I really started looking to it. So I went up to Jesse and said, hey, what do you think about voice acting? And she goes, yeah. I said, yeah. you know, it's expensive. She goes, <laughs> Yeah. At this time, I already have my photography business, so she's right. not worried about that. Um, you know it's big. She goes, what hobby of yours isn't? <laughs> I have a drum set, and photography takes up shelves. And I was like, all right, it's going to be like a three and a half by three foot booth. She goes, let's do it. Yeah. Sweet. So I started uh, investing and in building up f- uh, voice acting. At this point, we haven't even done anything with the game. It was just something he brought up. So I'm been uh, kind of voice acting for almost a year and a half before we even get to the part of voicing for Colony Siege. Huh. So I've actually built up a repertoire and figured out how to read script because obviously when you first start reading <laughs> the first time, you're like, you're <laughs> currently... Not and Jesse's like, he sounds like you're reading. It's like, well, I am reading. She goes, You need to make it sound like you're acting. It's like, right. Well, how do you do that? So, obviously, I learned how to cold read, and obviously, it's something that you have to do as a voice actor learning how to cold read and actually put emotion and feeling into it. Right. So, that kind of started developing and really learning how to create a character and character uh, development and all that stuff uh, way before Colony Siege. So, eventually, uh, they said, all right, we're not having everyone voice it. We're actually just going to have one character kind of explaining kind of like the briefing of the game. And his name is Commander. He's the Commander. Sure. All right. And as he started explaining what the Commander is supposed to, what his personality is, I said, that's not my voice. Because I understand now my my wheelhouse. Commander is very solemn, grim, kind of been through hell. He's a soldier. Yeah. Uh, so you think rough, gruff, deep, that, that's what I would think at least. So I was like, I can't do this. He goes, we're going to have you do it anyway. So, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so sure enough, I do my voice for commander, which is as low as I can get really. And he goes, mm, it needs to be lower. It's like, I can't get lower. I was like, if you really want the commander to sound lower, we need to hire an actual actor who has a lower 
pot timber. And he goes, mm, we can just do a pitch shift on it. And sure enough, we threw a little bit of pitch shift and it's, it sounded artifacty and all that stuff. I sent it to Tony Weiss because at this time we actually um, co-founded Immerse Productions. So this was May of 2019. Um, so we're talking and we're in June or July, maybe a little bit afterwards when we're actually recording. Actually, I think we're almost in October when we're recording for Colin E. Siege. Yeah. Um, and so Tony threw on like a nice little filter effect that it sounds like you're recording or you're talking through almost a like a captain's log kind of thing. It sounds very um, analog. And then he brought my voice down a little bit. You don't hear the artifacting of pitching it down. And he only pitched it down like 0.10 um, decimeters. <sighs> so very, very, very little. It didn't need much to bring it down to where it needed to be. Um, so that's Commander. He's just really down here, and he's not very. He's very monotone. Jesse's like he sounds monotone. It's like, <laughs> well, he, have you heard his story? He's gone through so much. Of course, he's monotone. Right. And this is she goes. You need more inflection. I had more inflection. It didn't sound right. All right. So sure enough, here here's Commander. And then uh, there is a little bit of a bit um, called Chaos, which is the uh, end planet of the game. And there's a point where I was like, what if Chaos was real? It was an actual entity. Huh. And Jim's like, huh. I said, what if it screamed as you beat the game? He goes, huh. Yeah. He goes, do you have any idea? And I was like, Aah! yeah. Aah! Something like that. <laughs> and I just clipped, obviously. But uh, yeah, that was, <laughs> something like that was chaos. And I, I did some other variations and stuff like that. And so, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that that is Commander and Chaos. Freaking awesome. Just absolutely awesome. I- Oh, gosh, how fun. What a great way to professionally break into this whole thing. Oh, yeah. wow. And then and then it continues on from there. Because mm-hmm. one of your more recent work that I found, The Mechanical mm-hmm. World of Dr. Gearbox, uh, yes. where you voiced characters, and, and you're also the casting director for this project. Uh, it's coming out later this year. Tell us about The Mechanical World of Dr. Gearbox. So The Mechanical World of Dr. Gearbox, uh, I was doing marketing as we all do, and I reached out to this company saying, hey, I really like your stuff. We started talking. Yeah. And one of the things at this point, I'm already, uh, I called myself a casting director at Immerse Productions. We had, I don't even think we've even done a game at this point, or maybe we just did our first one because we have cast a full game um, or a, a full demo of a game, which is continued planned for more later down the line. Huh. Um, so I actually said, hey, I can find the actors you need and I will do all the process of finding them if we come to a point where we need someone else. And they're like, ooh, that's, that's a really good proposition. And then I sent them my creature demo and he goes, I think you scared my family. <laughs> I said, I feel honored and I'm sorry at the same time. <laughs> he goes, no, it's really good. So we started talking, and they threw some uh, characters at me, and they said, here's this, here's this, and here's this. Let's see what you make of this. Little yeah. thing is a, a little mandafil is what we call it. He's like a little plant ninja with a little tail whip thing. And they're like, all right, what, what would this sound like? And I was like, <laughs> pitch it up, sent it to them. They're like, yeah, that's exactly what they think. <laughs> they sent me a little thing called a rock goblin. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's like the little thing's a little thing, and it's just, just throwing rocks. And they're like, yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's perfect. perfect. I was like, sounds good. And they're like, all right, here's one of the main characters. He's going to be explaining the process to the child because it's a, an RPG e-learning game mm. with turn or uh, uh, turn-based uh, combat. And they said, all right, this guy is called Botley, and he's like the main guy. They're like, here's a comic of like that we drew of Botley and oh, Dr. Nice. Gearbox talking. Um, what would he sound like? So I started reading um, the comic and creating the character, and I sent it off. I did the pitch shift and uh, the, made myself look sound like a robot, and I sent it to them. That's, they're like, this? All right, you're hired. <laughs> uh, so... 
it's it's hard to say exactly. Am I the casting director? Yes, um, but I'm more like. They just throw every single creature and person that they need voiced. And I go, I can do that or I need to find someone else. And I take the initiative to find someone else, have them audition for or several people. I listen through it and then I filter through it and send it off to them. And then they go, yes or no. Um, so obviously, they, the, as, as any casting director, you're not the final decision maker. You're just kind of the filter process that's doing all the work so that they don't have to. Um, so... It's it's hard to specifically say I'm the casting director since I'm a part of the project, but they have put me into the position that I am in the main decision maker in terms of, hey, we need to find someone else and let me find them for you. The more important lesson here is is the fact that you reached out to this potential client and offered them value. Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of manpower and service and so on and so forth, which mm-hmm. led to other other successes, obviously. Yes. And I think voice actor, and I think voice actors that are listening to this podcast right now who are doing nothing but here's my demo, here's my demo, here's my demo, here's my, here's my demo. Um, like you, if you had reached, if if people would reach out and offer mm-hmm. how they could be of service and provide mm-hmm. value to their client, they'd be more likely to book more stuff. Yeah, so that that's definitely the thing is you can't just reach out to them saying, I want to be a part of your project or I'm interested in your project. Here's my stuff. Um, that generally doesn't go over well. They usually go, oh, thank you. Or maybe they'll say, hey, we'll add you to the list, but they're not going to contact you. You didn't build a repertoire. You didn't kind of start a conversation and know that they're even engaged in the first place. Mm-hmm. So I start something, and it's not very long before I actually say, hey, are you looking for voice actors? Are you planning on adding voices to your project? Because obviously I don't want to waste their time, and I don't want to waste my time going back and forth for three or four days to eventually ask, are you looking for voiceover to find out they're not. Like, I eventually open up pretty quickly who I am and what I'm contacting them for, but I at least start some sort of conversation to say, hey, I really like your stuff. W- what inspired you or, or anything like that? You start something to get them to talk about their game. It's not about you. It's about them and what they're interested in. From there, once the conversation goes, then I go, hey, are you interested in voice actors or are you planning on voice actors? Because you don't even, even if you think that there could be voice actors, you can't say, are you exer- you're accepting demos? They might not even need voice actors. Right. So right. you can't just send them a demo saying, I'm interested in your project. They're like, we're not even voicing this game. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. That puts you on a blacklist and they send that to everyone else and say, don't hire this voice actor because they have no idea what we're even about. <laughs> they just sent us a demo and we don't need it. So in in other situations, you actually build up, you start talking to them, then you ask a question, and then if they are interested, then I continue on with, all right, here's my demo if you're interested in. And then if they seem like they've already started the process for casting, then obviously I don't say anything about casting. But if it seems like, yeah, we're planning on doing voiceover at one point, but we're probably several months out, then I go... By the way, I'm the co-founder of an audio production company, and we provide casting. And what this does is you can continue working on your game and spend all your time and effort into that, and I will do everything else. Nice. Why listen to 100 auditions when you could listen to 10? Precisely. Oh, gosh, that's good. That's marketing right there. That's oh, that's really helpful, I'm sure, to a bunch of people that are listening. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Nice. And is that how you approached Jenna Harley and the Universe Machine, which is an animation project that you're particularly interested about? Tell mm-hmm. us about that. So this actually was uh, LinkedIn. I was just doing the the regular thing you do on LinkedIn, just connecting with people. Uh, VT, VT Animation, he ended up, uh, after we connected, he ended up sending me a message saying, hey, blah, blah, blah. Um, Or I don't know who made the first initial contact. Uh, But at any point, our conversation started talking. He goes, oh, you're a voice actor. He goes, funny thing is I have a project that's coming out where I need the voice of Zeus uh, for this one project. Um, would you be interested? I said, yeah, sounds good. Send me everything. So we start emailing and I started recording everything. And he goes, 
actually, I found someone else. And I said, oh, darn it. And he goes, but I have another project that's <laughs> kind of coming up. And if you're interested, uh, I would like to have you audition for it. I said, sure. And he goes, all right. Um, this is a little tiny bot. And he's sarcastic. <laughs> and he sent me the the specs of Tracker. And I was like, this is a really cute little robot. How the heck is he sarcastic? Is what I'm thinking in my head. I'm like, how am I supposed to make him sound cute and sarcastic at the same time? So I started reading it to him and I sent it to him. And as soon as I sent him my samples, he goes, oh my gosh. Ah, yes. That is what I was looking for. He goes, eventually as we start talking months and actually I've almost been part of the project for a year. Um, as we started talking, I actually found out that several other people had ended up uh, auditioning for Tracker throughout uh, the time he was kind of looking for it. And he goes, they just didn't hit the mark of what I was looking for Tracker. And he goes, because they were almost doing like the the robot effect kind of sound or the, the monotone robot or anything like that. And I took it completely different. He, he kind of said he was interested in Bender. Obviously, this guy's too cute to be Bender. So <laughs> I kind of threw in a little bit of this. And um, um, Tracker kind of developed. Uh, wow. And I sent the raw. I didn't do any robot sounding to it. And he said, this is everything that I was looking for. Yes. Eventually, I ended up throwing sound effects onto Tracker, and that developed even further. Uh, so that's kind of where this project has started and is kind of currently at. We're, we're in the process of... We're, uh, VT has a great YouTube channel. He's very fluid animations. He's very, very talented. This is a, a passion project that he's been developing for years. He's finally at the point where he's got the script finalized and he's got everything. And I've met the voice actress of Jenna Harley. And then there was another um, character, um, which is Annie, and she needed a voice. And I was like, all right, I see AI. I'm like, I know the perfect actress that I could recommend for this. He goes, go for it. And it's like, Sarah McManus. I said, sounds good. I'm going to reach out to her. Sarah McManus did her AI, which she's a fabulous AI voice actress. She's um, from the UK. Huh. And as soon as she sent that to him, he goes, oh my gosh, we have <laughs> Annie. Right there. So yep. sure enough, we ended up getting Annie. We have Tracker and we have Jenna, the three main characters. And then actually, I kind of helped point out the possible of Doc when we're at that point. So actually, that is still in discussion, but we possibly already have Doc that I ended up recommending as well. Wow. Um, so, yeah, we're in the process of recording the trailer of the build. He's actually working on another project called Monologamation, where he just writes a random uh, chunk of monologues. Sends that out to a group of voice actors in in the in the team and says, pick out whichever monologue you want and read it however you want. And the way you read it, I will animate it based on that. Oh, how cool is that? Really cool project. He's actually just he, that's going to premiere uh, in two days on the tenth. Wow. Um, so monologamation on <laughs> VT animation will be. Um, I'm not in the trailer because I. He, as we were talking, he was talking about monologamation. I was like, yeah, aren't, aren't you going to start that? He goes, yeah, I've already started it. I said, well, oh. we already talked about it. He goes, oh, my gosh, I forgot to send you the link. <laughs> oh, I was no. like, yeah. He goes, I did. I goes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was like, mm, I see. I see. How That's it how is. it is. <laughs> I'm just left out on, here in uh, the outfield and you're uh, over there having fun. I'm like, throw me in, coach. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Ah, that's oh, Christian. This is a lot. This is a lot of of work and stories and encounters and and luck and happenstance effort. Mm -hmm. Now, at, at at this place in your journey, both personally and professionally, mm -hmm. you sound very happy. Like you're happy to be here in this place in your journey as a voice actor and as a person moving through this timeline. Yeah. Um, are you happy? Oh, I would say yes. I am a happy by nature um, for the most part. And I, I think that's due to, um, again, my upbringing 
I think it's due to my relationship with Christ and just being thankful for every little moment. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you have your ups and downs. I'm a father of a five-year-old, so there's a oh. lot of stress to that as well. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but it, it's it's a great, I, I, I say children are like a cute little bundle of chaos. Um, and it's true. Yeah. And it, it's a lot of fun. And you just got to be thankful for even the, the crummy things. Uh, Jesse and I, last year, um, during what we called Snowmageddon, which was a huge snowstorm we had, um, we got in a car accident because we got stuck on a hill and then got, it, it was chaos. Um, but during the entire process, Jesse and I not once felt angry or upset or bitter or anything. We we're like, after all of this, our door was nearly like off the hinges almost wow. at one point. And the car, thankfully, wasn't totaled, so we were able to get that fixed. After that entire process, we still felt content and grateful. And I think that kind of attests to our lifestyle and just allowing whatever happens, happens. Whether it's the bad, it's good, there's always something behind it. And we always believe, at least I believe, that God has a reason for everything. Whether you're going through a storm or you're um, having a good time, mm-hmm. uh, and you're you're in the best time because life is a roller coaster, and there's ups and there's downs, and you just got to be thankful even in the downs that you have the ups and that you can look forward to the ups. And uh, it it it's yeah. I think it's a really mentally and emotionally a great place to be uh, yes. for however and whatever your reason or motivation may be, but that's a really good place to be. And um, I can see why you're so successful, both professionally and personally and spiritually as well. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. What? I've, I've got goosebumps. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Congratulations on life. Nicely done. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm still not even halfway there. <laughs> Just, again, it, I take one day at a time. A lot of people, yeah. I always get this at the beginning of the year. Everyone's like, all right, 2019 was crap. Let's make 2020 better. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. But anyway, um, <laughs> I always go, why look at your year as bad or good? Yeah. Because if you look at it that way, you're going to be in a sour mood because usually everyone looks back at the end of the year and they said, well, that was crap. (laughs) Even though if you're like, "Eh, if you look at how much actually was crap versus how much was good and or content, you're probably actually faring on the good side for the most part. Obviously, there's different situations and you're in different parts of life and walks and everyone's situation is different. But for the most part, everyone lumps. All right. Well, I had three bad months in a row. Three bad months. Well, if you think about it, there's 12 months in a year. <laughs> what about the other nine? Yeah. <laughs> what about the other nine? Well, that one was okay. Well, okay, that's okay. Well, that <laughs> one was good. Okay, that's good. Why look at your life in a year? Why look at your life in months? Because you can have one bad week in a month and then three good or decent ones. And you look back at the month, you're like, well, that one bad week ruined my month. That's a bad month. It's like, no, 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 no. That one bad week was a bad week. Yeah. That one bad, those bad three days doesn't make it a bad week. So if you go one day at a time, that's, it's like, you, you gotta go one day at a time. It's a good day. It's a good day. It's a bad day. You know, there's always tomorrow. And with that perspective, what are some short term and long term goals? Short term goals, just survive, have fun. Mm. Um, Right now, it survived the pandemic. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, but it's it's just kind of take every day at a time and uh, just continue doing what I'm doing. I'm enjoying what I'm doing, and I, obviously, I want to continue pursuing voice acting, whether that's full time or not. I'm really, really enjoying the work I'm doing with Idea Spectrum and with Jim, my father in law. I'm really enjoying this work. I'm thankful that I have a stable job even through this tough time. And I'm thankful that I'm able to support my family um, doing what I'm doing. So when I go full-time voice acting, I don't know. Yeah, It's hard to give up a consistent 
a permanent job and consistent pay that you can rely on every single month. And vo- photography, I continue wanting to do. So wh- where where am I going to see myself in five years? Well, maybe Jim sells the company in five years and no longer is doing uh, the software company. Well, in, in that case, then maybe I will try to pursue full-time voiceover and software design and or uh, uh, website design and photography. Or maybe I'll still be at the company. I, I, it's hard to tell. But yeah. I'm kind of leaving everything open to see kind of what comes next. Day by day. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And these are, these are questions I ask everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of journeys and taking it day by day, I, I personally believe that the equipment that we have used in the past, started out with, and what you're using now are interesting mile markers of our progress Mm -hmm. in this industry. I assume you have a home studio as well. Um, I'm curious, what does the box on the inside look like and what recording gear equipment did you start out with and what you're using now? So what it looks like on the inside, it's actually on my Instagram page. If you go to instagram.com slash voice of a boy. That will actually, if you scroll through in one of my pictures, it actually has the photo of my booth that is current. Um, what I started out with, again, was that $50 Neewer microphone. And I was like, all right, we need a, a way to hook this up to the system. So I got a $30 Behringer interface. That sucked. Um, obviously, almost immediately before, I don't even think I used the Neewer. It was like we we're setting it up and... Something was up with the audio that I was like, all right, we need a microphone. So I went to uh, Guitar Center and I bought a Rode NT1. Yeah. Yep. And I was using that for a time. I was using Audacity, but Audacity was doing something. As soon as I set it up, Audacity was doing something to my voice. It was like dropping it down an octave. (laughs) Jesse was recording it. It was an octave lower. It's like, that's not our voice. So I ended up getting Reaper. Um. And I was using my laptop in, I'm still using the same laptop, but the laptop was inside my booth at the time, um, which obviously is not a good idea. Don't have your laptop in your booth because it blows heat when it needs to cool down and therefore heat is getting blown into your non-circulating booth. And I actually (laughs) overheated one time during a two hour recording session for a project. Um, I was very, very sick the next day. (laughs) So do not have your laptop in said booth. That's a, a pointer. There we go. Um, <laughs> but I did a project um, for, or SBN3, SBN. Uh, I did a, uh, a project for him the very first time. And he, we did a live session. It was the first time I ever did live recording. And I sent him the audio. And the very first thing he goes is, are you using a road by chance? And I said, <laughs> yes. And he goes, are you using the road NT1A? And I was like, no, it's the road NT1. And he goes, you need to get rid of it. I said, what? Why? This is a $200 mic. Like, it's a decent microphone. He goes, it does not complement your voice very well. I said, what, 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 what do you mean? He goes, you you have a sibilant uh, voice. Uh, your S's come through and you're, you have a brighter voice, which the roads are known for being bright. So the bright voice and a bright microphone make bad mess. <laughs> I said, oh, what would you recommend? He goes, honestly, a Audio-Technica AT2020 would be better than what you're using right now. I said, what? And I was like, okay, I believed him. (laughs) I bought an uh, Audio-Technica 2020. I eventually sold my Rode NT1 to another voice actress, and I used the Audio-Technica AT2020 for two or three days. (laughs) <laughs> and I returned it and got the AT2035, which was there like $50 go. more. But it had a, based on, if you look at the, the graph and stuff, it just had a little bit of more lower end. And I wanted to pull a little bit more lower end out of my voice. So I recorded out of the AT2035 for well over a year. 
until I saved up enough to purchase the Sennheiser 416. Mm. Um, so that's what I'm currently using is this shotgun microphone. Now, in terms of my interface, that was replaced within two or three months because my father-in-law bought it as a gift for me because ah. I was like, hey, if you want me to voice in Colony Siege, we need a better interface. And so <laughs> the current one I'm using is kind of meh. So he actually ended up buying me the Audient, uh, Audient ID4 yeah. um, as a gift. And so this thing is fantastic. Now, my current setup is I have a desk, a stool. I would prefer to be standing up, but circumstances, I'm not standing up. Um, and actually, I have a monitor and a keyboard, mouse, and a camera in here. Because as I started um, recording or setting up for Behind the Slate, which was October of 2018, um, I ended up, <clears throat> uh, I was like, all right, well, I need to sit down for an hour and a half or whatever session. So I ended up building my own desk out of uh, a MDF and two by four and then put some padding on top of it and then some uh, fabric. Nice. And then now my, my laptop is sitting outside of my booth and wired via HDMI into this monitor, et cetera, et cetera. And then I have my camera right above my monitor to act as a webcam. Wow. A full service setup. That's yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Now, after a really, really long day, Christian, and you're sitting at the bar and there is no COVID-19 because we're in the imaginary world. And the bartender says, hey, what do you have? What do you have? I go, water. <laughs> Not really. Uh, I do <laughs> obviously drink lots and lots of water because every voice actor should. Of course. Stay hydrated. I probably drink about 120 ounces a day because wow. I have my trusty 40-ounce water bottle that I carry around with me throughout every day. And I fill it up about three or four times a day. Nice. So in terms of what drink pleasure do I like to do, I enjoy a nice little Moscow Mule, Old Fashioned, Ooh. Manhattan, Ooh. you name it. I, I really like the different cocktails. I um, actually got into mixology, actually, um, because Jesse was doing a show, a performance. <laughs> we had just done, I brought her dinner, and that was, who knows, 35, 40 bucks for dinner um, for all of us. So then I was like, all right, well, after the show, maybe we should uh, meet up with everyone. We should get drinks. And she goes, well, that's going to be another 30 bucks or whatever. And yeah. She goes, we'll, we'll do it another time. I said, no, oh, that sounds good. So I ended up going home and I was sitting there and twiddling my thumbs. And I was like, <gasps> what if I got a, a, a shaker and I got some <laughs> vodka? We didn't even have vodka in our house. I don't even think we really had any alcohol in our house. And I, you know, I bought some vodka and some fresh lemons and I made lemon drops and a... Oh, I forgot what the other one is. It's like a grapefruit drop, basically. And so <laughs> she came home to lemon drops. And obviously it costs about 30 bucks for everything. But now I have all the equipment and stuff to do that. So it doesn't not doesn't cost as much when you want uh, a little something. Um, so, yes, uh, I just enjoy different drinks. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I enjoy making them, too. Of man of many talents, man, Jesse's super happy. I that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Christian, what's next? Tell us about what's coming up. Um, so I just literally finished. Um, obviously, Jenna Harley in the Universe Machine. Really excited for that. Yeah. Um, that's again, we're hitting trailer, so we haven't even started recording the episodes. I even got Lily, my my daughter, to possibly even have a character later down. Ah! The line. Cute. Um, super cute. We we did a little enactment, and the uh, VT literally had a uh, he a heart attack. He was so <laughs> she, he's like, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> so super excited for that. Um, again, the uh, the m wonderful world of Doctor Gearbox is super exciting. That's an RPG e learning game. Yeah. Basically, it's directed towards kids to where children can answer questions. It's turn by ta turn turn based combat, but when it's the kids' turn, they have to answer a set of questions. And if they get them right, the the better the spell or the better the loot drop. Oh, draw. nice! So it's a learning. Now, parents, it, there's going to be forty STEM lessons in the game alone, wow. but parents and educators can actually edit the game and put in their own questions. Oh, At least that's, that's the plan. As to where they can put in their own questions, say a child is uh, studying for social studies and they have a quiz coming up. The 
parent could put in the information. They can play the game and learn and study for their test at the same time as leveling up their character. So it, the concept is phenomenal. Wow. I'm really excited about that project. Colony Siege right now is going to be going into early access in July. We're only going to hit early access for three to four months, and then we're going to go full launch. Um, so that by the end of this month or so, or end of this year, we should hopefully release the full thing of Colony Siege. Again, that has been a, a, a close part of my heart because I've done a lot. I didn't just do voice acting. I designed the space scapes. Um, so when you load a, a mission, you'll see this nice little space scape and animation like twinkling stars and stuff. Wow. I designed that um, in Photoshop and stuff like that. Um, so I'm really excited for that project. And I had a little bit of hand in it with with stuff. I actually named, <laughs> named the company. Finny Fugle Games was, we were on a cruise and we had a game company name picked out and that didn't work because of trademark. And so we spent most of our cruise just <laughs> banging our head to, with different questions, trying to check trademarks and all that stuff. Nothing was coming up. Eventually I was looking up like old far-fetched words and stuff like that. And sure enough, <laughs> Finny Fugle, which actually means the dislike or disdain or hate of endings. Oh, interesting. And I said, what about Funy Fugle Games? And they're like, oh, that's perfect. The 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 hate of endings. Yeah. So that is uh the the company. Um so yeah, one of the 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 games that I just did recently that I was cast in was called Between the Stars. Um and that's like a space battle. Um I'm I'm playing a soldier. Uh, soldiers and warriors are kind of my my niche, as well as robots and creatures, as well as upbeat and um, upbeat hero, soldier, and variety. Because I'm pretty versatile. At least a lot of people, uh, a lot of my clients say that I'm versatile. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is like space battle. I'm literally screaming almost every line. Um, so th- this one I'm really excited about um, to to take a look at. And then there's uh, the game that Tony and I helped cast, which is called um, Undying Flower. Undying Flower is going to be hitting alpha hopefully sometime this year. Actually, they're doing some internal pre-alpha testing right now. Um, And then we're planning on casting the rest of that project later down the line. Um, So, again, really excited for that. I have another one, two or three on the table um, and then probably a handful of other ones on the table for possible casting at the moment. Again, I feel that doing the legwork, lay, lay building up the relationship with the de- developers and stuff like that has been so much more special. I've mm-hmm. built up this um, care for the project. I actually get invested in the project. I've been following these these developers and really kind of investing myself into what they're doing um it's a lot of work you could go three four five months trying to even get on uh just kind of supporting them and just checking up on them yeah three or four months and then they might be casting they might come reach out to me or they might do a casting call if they do a casting call i'm going to be auditioning against everyone else my chances of getting cast is not going to be any greater than anyone else's because it's not about technically the connection. It's about, obviously, if I fit the role or not. So, yeah, it's a lot of work, but I feel a part of these projects. And if I get cast in them, it's that much more better. Absolutely. It's amazing because then I'm a part of this project and I understand exactly what's happening and I feel passionate about what they're doing and what it's about. I just got cast in... uh, a game called Crystal Story, and that's an RPG game, and I'm really excited for that, but I don't know much about it besides the additional research because it was just a regular casting call. I read for my characters, and that was it. So I I, I know a bit of it, but I don't know too much about it. Um, so again, my, my excitement for it is just because it's another game that's going to be released, and I'm really excited about that, but I don't know much about the game itself. Yeah. Um, and then one game that just launched that I had the privilege of voicing in was Grand Guilds, and I was the male citizens in Grand Guilds. Oh, my gosh. That's so many. <laughs> and that's the only ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, my gosh. Congratulations. I, it's so great to see a voice actor succeed in this journey, in this industry so much. That's 
<laughs> I'm clipping here, and I don't care. I'm going to cut it out later. Uh, I'll feel limit free. It. Feel free to cut out any of that if it seems a little too much, or if it seems like I'm talking too highly. Because I, I try to be as humble as I can, and I don't generally talk about myself too much. Well, I, 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 you know what? I'm going to respectfully disagree. Um, we're here to celebrate you, Christian, and I'm going to include every bit of that in the final cut. They okay. Promise. <laughs> Just take the damn compliment. Okay, <laughs> I'll do it. Don't hit me. Uh, okay, last question. If the listeners here would like to find out more about you and your work, where can they go to find you? So I have a website, christianoboyle.com, um, Twitter at Voice of Oboyle, Instagram, even Facebook, but I don't really pay, post on Facebook that much. Um, and then there's a YouTube channel if you type in Christian O'Boyle. But again, what's on the YouTube channel, you're going to find on all the other social medias. So, uh, yeah, that's the the main place uh, I can be located and found. Christian, it's been a great hour and a half or, or so of listening to just, just some really awesome stories of a human. Like, as driven and as 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 successful and awesome as you are, I I, th- I think this episode brings the successful voice actors down, and I apologize for using it that way, but down from their pedestal into an, an actual human being. Look at you! You're a human. Who thought? I am. <laughs> Thank you very much for spending some time here with me and and sharing your story. I I'm I'm hundred percent sure that listeners here have received a bunch of motivation and inspiration from your stories. I think that's super super great. Well, thank you. It's it's been a lot of fun. I I again enjoy talking to other voice actors in the industry. That is why I was doing behind the slate for a while. I ended up. Uh, almost permanently postponing that it might come back but i'm not entirely sure i kind of just got burnt out um from just the the amount of effort and work into it not saying that it's not that much it was just i'm really busy already as it is so it was just a lot of time that i was taking out of family and stuff like that um but i do have a couple other projects that i'm planning on doing um in the future so who knows if those will emerge or not but we'll see for what it's worth I hope it comes back so that you'll have more opportunities to interact with other voice actors I really yeah, do and I, I think it will come back at one point I definitely uh, feel that there's a potential for it to emerge again just right now I'm taking time and enjoying not <laughs> constantly having something going on I'm sure my <laughs> wife appreciates that as well thank you so much and then I, I look forward to connecting with you more on Twitter and other socials and, and hearing more of your successes I, I can't wait of course well I enjoy seeing your your success as well this has been Voice Actor Showcase visit our website at voiceactorshowcase.com if you'd like to be featured on this podcast contact us at voiceactorshowcase.com thanks for listening